Welcome back. So nice to uh, have all of you joining me again. Um, this podcast episode is very exciting because I have a guest and um, those of you who've introduced or sorry, listened to some of my episodes in the past have noticed that I talk alone a lot and I just talk about different topics. But I for 2024, I wanted to include uh, more guests. And as I have uh, met some incredibly interesting people in my travels last year. I, I'm trying to include as many of them as I can. And at the top of the list is my guest today, and it's Yuri Chusu, who I met in Costa Rica in the jungle, as uh, I've done a podcast episode about that. And we sat side by side having uh, a meal one day and just started to talk about our experiences. We have friends in common, which is wonderful, but we had just met. And Yuri inspires me uh, with her attitude toward life and travel and people, and also our discussion around her own personal um, journey with therapy. So welcome, Yuri, if you'd like to give a bit of an introduction to who you are, what you do, and that sort of thing, that'd be great. Hi, Bonnie. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited. We had talked about mental health the first time that we you know, introduced each other to her in Costa Rica. And I'm really excited to be here and talk more about it. So I am a full spectrum human. I feel like I have lived multiple lives, but currently I am based in Argentina after traveling the world for about 20 months straight. And I went through a lot of journeys in that travel and a lot of mental health journeys also in my lifetime. So I feel like this is a beautiful space to t dive deeper into that world. Yeah, and that was the thing I think I noticed so much about you um, in Costa Rica is, you know, I think a lot of kind of um, layers of things we put on, like makeup, <laughs> fixing our hair, uh, that sort of thing were taken away from us because obviously we were, we were just uh, pretty, just kind of getting through every day um sweating <laughs> a lot <laughs> and so it wasn't there was no point in trying to make yourself uh, pretty and so i think um it was kind of bare bones and everybody was just really um honest and open uh in that environment a lot of us anyway were and i think obviously jennifer dawn who ran the uh retreat inspired that by her own openness but you sat next to me and you told me a little bit of your own your own journey through therapy and we've talked just a little bit after that about sort of um which inspired me for, to have you as a guest on this podcast where we talk about therapy and the myths and the way in which um i want to try to educate people about what therapy is really about and i found your uh, story interesting because you had mentioned that you had been in therapy kind of on and off since you were 19 and you look like you're 19 and a half, but I know you're not. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a bit of a long time. So do you want to talk about that a bit? Just what what that's been like for you to kind of integrate therapy into your life, really? Yeah. So when I was 19, I started well, I, it was my second year of university and it was just a lot of changes. It was a big transitional time for me going from high school into university and I dealt with a lot of stress and stress that was very difficult to navigate through and I come from a family I'm Chinese my parents are Chinese and our family does not talk about emotions or mental health so I felt very isolated in my struggles and that's when I first turned to a therapist it was in my campus in university and my therapist was Chinese. So that on its own instantly made me feel like I had somebody who understood me. She was Chinese, she was a female, and I was having conversations with her that I could never have with my mother. And it was very comforting to have that space to just be able to talk about whatever it was that I was navigating through. And I was 19 then, which, I mean, that's over a decade ago, but at that age, back then, I didn't know people who were doing therapy. It was kind of something that felt like 
a, not a desperate attempt at feeling better, but it was something that really pushed my comfort zone. But I walked away with so much healing and understanding from it. And it really set the tone towards the self inquiry and, and transformational journey that I embarked since then. Okay, there's so many questions I have about just that bit. So I want to talk about the fact that you found a Chinese female, because I think that's really interesting. But back up before that, you said that it was, you know, it took you out of your comfort zone. I hear from people a lot in my private practice that are reaching out, thinking about therapy, and they say things like, I'm overwhelmed, I'm nervous, I don't know what this is going to be like, I've avoided doing this, but it's been on my mind for a long time. This real kind of anxiety or, or nervousness or out of your comfort zone sort of feeling about taking that step into uh, therapy. Can you talk a little bit about what that was about, do you think, for you? Yeah, I think for me, it was something that was so different than what I was used to. I, like I said, like I didn't grow up in an environment where we talked about our feelings. It just wasn't in my experience. And I really had to challenge myself in that regard and try something new, something different, because I wanted so badly to feel better, to feel under or to understand what I was going through, that I knew I had to do something different in order to feel different. Mm, yeah. Um, and I'm assuming it was offered at the university. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, it was offered at the university. I don't think I had to pay for it. I mean, we're university students, so it was something that the school offered. And yeah, it was the first, it was my, I switched universities and it was in my second university in my first year that I did that. Yeah. And do you feel like that feelings, the feelings that people typically have, the totally normal feelings about nervousness about it, anxiety about what it's going to be like, um, feelings of overwhelm or, or out of your comfort zone. How long did that last once you started? Did that kind of linger as you were working with her? It didn't quite linger. And I would say that even though I grew up in a household where we did not talk about our feelings, it's something I had always wanted to do. Mm. I'm a very open person and I've always been, and I've always been a big feeler, very sensitive. I just didn't have that environment around me, but I always wanted it. So when I had it, when I had that room with my therapist, I, f I felt like I finally had that space mm -hmm. or that environment that I could take up that space and not feel bad or know that I was not going to be judged. Yeah. Yeah. That judgment thing. I think um, <laughs> you and I were talking just briefly before this, just sort of about prepping for this um, recording and that idea of what maybe it's what therapy is like that's different than maybe a, a regular relationship out there in the regular world. And I think that, you know, I know in our training, obviously, um, a big part of my intention when I'm working with clients is to be able to hold the what they're saying without my own mind coming in to judge or to decide whether that's right or wrong, good or bad just to really try to stay very present with what they're saying. And any good therapist, I think, will do that and really try to be there with exactly what you're talking about in a way that then translates to you to feel just that somebody's validating your feelings without, you know, decision about whether it's good or bad, how you're feeling or, you know, judging in any, any way. Mm -hmm. The second thing I thought was interesting is this finding a... Chinese female that you could speak to being a Chinese female yourself. Speak mm -hmm. to that sort of cultural aspect of that, because I'm assuming you still aren't seeing her. Um, mm -hmm. And that maybe there's been different um, cultural experiences with therapy for you. So how important was that, do you think, for you at the time? Yeah, I don't think I intentionally sought that out. I don't think I went in with the mindset of I'm going to find someone who's Chinese and a female. It just kind of happened. But being around her, I was feeling very validated for my experiences with my parents because she got it. I didn't have to explain. I didn't have to, you know, yeah, create a 
or share a bigger story than what I was feeling because she literally got it. I don't know if you know the term tiger mom, Chinese tiger mom, but I definitely have one. So it's a very unique experience to have a mother type of that sort. And I've become the person I am because of that dynamic that I have. But with that therapist, she just understood it because she went through that herself. Mm. So I felt very connected to her in that regard and it made therapy a lot smoother especially her being my first therapist yeah that's i guess kind of what i wanted to talk about because i think you know you you told me that you've subsequently had therapy off and on um a decade on which i still can't believe um and so i'm assuming it hasn't always been with chinese therapists or has it no it has not and so how has that been different for you yeah, so when it hasn't been a Chinese therapist, I don't think I've spoken about that as much. I can think of a therapist I had a couple of years ago, and she was Caucasian. And I don't think I brought up my mother as much, or maybe I did, but it wasn't the same level of, I know that you get it. There was just something inherently not there, just because she she hadn't gone through the experiences I had gone through. Not to say that she wasn't a better, ther a, as good of a therapist. It just was a different dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, um, in therapy, uh, as a therapist in training, I remember often we would ask that sort of question because, you know, over the years I've met people in all sorts of different um with all sorts of different backgrounds and experiences and clearly couldn't have possibly had all of those experiences. That would be strange. Um, so I have to work really hard sometimes to put myself into as best as I can, their, their situation. That is my job really is to try to, mm -hmm. to get inside <laughs> your head as much as possible. And I would imagine, you know, I meet uh, a 61 year old white woman who lives in Manhattan, maybe possible, possibly easier for me to get inside her head because that's really my experience right now versus, yeah, meeting um, someone who doesn't have that background. But I have found through the years that I work with all sorts of people uh, successfully. And I wonder, like you mentioned, having her, the Chinese therapist at the beginning of your sort of therapy journey mm -hmm. and maybe that being quite a critical step for you um, because maybe your mother uh, or whatever was was more of a topic that you wanted to needed to kind of work through at that point um, I spoke with someone the other day and they were talking about very clearly they needed a trauma therapist for a very specific time versus a, a therapist who doesn't work with trauma doesn't have that experience and someone who doesn't have that experience could actually kind of not be nearly as helpful as a therapist who has that trauma experience. So I think it's really important for the client, for you to say, what I need is, and, and when you were 19 to have that clarity that I think I need someone who will get it, that it won't take me, you know, weeks and weeks of trying to explain what a tiger mom is. I have a sense of it just from what I've heard about in the media, but clearly have not had one. So I think that's, I think that's an interesting point. And I think it's something for me, I always bring back to people have to try to make the best decision for themselves in finding the right therapist. It can be quite a journey to find the right therapist. Sometimes I think you probably were quite fortunate to find um, her at the time that you needed her in the university setting, maybe where you didn't have to pay for it because put all those mm -hmm. together and it might have been a slim chance. So in, in, in the years of therapy subsequent to that, was it possible maybe that that was a less important issue that you were, you were kind of um, addressing? Yeah, I think the right therapist has shown up in the period of my life where I needed one. And I've gone through numerous therapists. And yes, for that period of time when I was younger, starting therapy, having that Chinese female therapist was an easier entry point for me into the world of therapy. But then, 
in years after, I stopped for a while. I lived my life, you know, became quote an adult and, and worked in the corporate world and such. And my challenges and struggles definitely changed, you know, as I grew older. And then when I went back into therapy, it was a different form of therapy. I actually did it through better help. And I was doing therapy where we entered into like an online session and we would just type. We had the option of doing a call, like a voice call, a video call, or just typing. And for mm -hmm. some reason, I did the typing and I actually really liked that for that period of time. It allowed me to think about my thoughts a bit more before I, I put them out for my therapist to see and read. And I didn't feel maybe this pressure to on the spot have an answer, but in that period of time, it worked for me. And she wasn't Chinese. She was female, but I kind of, in that time of my life, that's what I needed. And I love the fact that you said knowing what is it that we want out of therapy is really important because it definitely evolved. And now after that therapist, I'm back into doing video calls and then that works for me as well. So it's just a matter of finding the method that works for you and that can change and that's totally okay. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that it can change also. Um, I was having lunch with a friend a couple of weeks ago and she's like, what, you know, like, what's the average amount of time people are in therapy? <laughs> and like, that's just a really impossible question to answer. And people ask that too, when they start, they'll say, this is what I feel. How long do you think I need to see you? Because <laughs> they're always looking for the end point, sort of like a dentist that way. I get it. Um, but it's really, I think one of the misconceptions about therapy is that um, there is like this one thing or this finite sort of situation that you're going to try to solve and then you're good to go and you don't, you know, there's nothing more. And I'm not saying everybody should have therapy all the time, although I'm not really opposed to that. Because <laughs> I think the benefit of talking with somebody in a non-judgmental way who is validating you is a really, um, in today's world, something that we don't encounter a lot. You know, a lot of us are not around a lot of people who listen well or are validating or always, you know, um, I don't know, as present as maybe we need them. And so to have a therapist who is a constant, whose job it is to validate and listen to you in a way sometimes is, is just what you need. You know, it's just, it's not about fixing something necessarily. It's just about having that constant relationship that is incredibly uh, validating and present. So I think following what you said, just understanding that your needs may be different at different times and you may feel different sort of um, perspectives or different responses to, to what your therapist or what you want out of therapy, uh, that can change and that's perfectly fine. What do you think has been the like sort of, I don't mean like greatest hits, but sort of the overall greatest benefit from the therapy that you have had. Um, how do you how do you kind of see that um, playing out in your day to day life? Like what therapy has done for you? Yeah, therapy off the bat from that very first therapist at nineteen. The concept of self awareness. The concept of self awareness was really something that I took away from that therapist. And I've really, it's like a muscle that I've really worked on since I started this journey of mine and being aware of my thoughts, being aware that every single day we have over 60,000 thoughts, 80% of those are negative, 90% of those are past thoughts. And just having that understanding that I am programmed in a specific way and that we all are actually, just being aware of my programming, that has really allowed me to not just understand myself better, but have more compassion with myself. Mm. And that I can't control the thoughts that come up, but I can control how I react to them. And the first step is self-awareness. Mm. So that's been something that I've really, really worked on and I continuously work on, um, as you previously said, a goal of therapy is not to quote, fix you. I don't think we're ever fixed. It's more about 
having more awareness of yourself, having more compassion, having more tools in your toolbox to navigate through life. Yeah. So self-awareness has been huge for me that I've really gained from therapy and also practicing taking up space because when you go into a session with a therapist, you are there and you have the ability to just literally vent, to talk about anything that's weighing you down. And we don't typically have these spaces outside of therapy. I mean, some people fortunately do with their partners or friends or even great coworkers, but it can sometimes feel like you are putting your problems or issues on somebody else. And that can, for me at least, that can make me feel guilty or I don't wanna bother you. But when you're in therapy, that's exactly what the therapist is there for, is to be almost like a sounding board or just somebody to validate your feelings and to, to be there with you as you're going through these experiences. So that has been really good for me. Like there have been some sessions where before I go into the session, I'm like, I don't know what to talk about. Like, I'm doing okay. I don't really need it, but I have the session. So I'm just going to release whatever it is that's weighing me down. And I'll come out of the session literally feeling lighter, mm. like physically lighter because I'm unloading. And that in itself is so powerful to just be able to unload. Yeah, yeah. That that idea of, you know, self-awareness, can we pick apart that a little bit for people who maybe haven't had therapy and don't quite understand what that process is like and what therapy does to help you get that thing? So if you could just kind of describe it a little bit, like what is self-awareness like for you? Yeah, self-awareness. So when I think about self-awareness, I think about when I'm doing something, why is it that I'm doing this? Is it because I'm doing an autopilot? Is it because I'm literally used to doing the sequence of events? That's one example of just questioning like why I'm doing something. And then with the thoughts, when all these thoughts come up, I've never been diagnosed with ADHD, but I'm pretty sure I have some level of it because I have so, so many thoughts and I just go all over the place. And sometimes I can't even grasp what I'm thinking about, but having that self-awareness creates space in between those thoughts, this thought comes up, and then it's not just reacting to the thought or feeling the emotion that that thought creates, but taking a step back and almost witnessing the thought. Like, oh, that came up interesting and not just okay what well, and then have to do this and do that and just kind of go out in like a hamster wheel but creating that space between the thoughts is where the self-awareness is for me yeah i love the way you describe that um the space i always say mm -hmm. take a beat it's about taking the mm -hmm. beat and i love that taking the space to be able to think you know just see the thought but not necessarily buy into it, you know? I think that's something we've all sort of grown up with this idea that um, what we think is true and that's just the way it is. And so you can have, depending on what's happened to you, and you have an incredibly interesting background, having um, a Chinese uh, parents, but then you told me you were born in Peru so really contrasting cultures for you as far as talking and expressiveness. And so this, this idea that um, the thoughts that you would be having coming from that background and being born somewhere else, they could be kind of argumentative thoughts. You know, a lot of times I talk to people about the arguments they're having in their head because you're feeling one way and you think you should be feeling another way or you thinking something and you think you should be thinking something else. Um, do you think that contrasting uh, cultures was part of that need for you to sort of find that space so that you could hold up a thought and think, wait a minute, is this necessarily true or is it just something that I'm thinking because of what's happened to me? 
Yeah, I love the fact that you brought up my background because definitely that is a part of, that is a reason why I am who I am. You know, genetically, I'm one way and culturally, I'm a whole different way. And Chinese and Peruvian cultures are very different, <laughs> extremely different in the, in the way of dealing with emotions and the way of expressing themselves. And I definitely had a clash and I'm sure I still do because it's very contrasting, right? So for me, I guess I never, when I was younger, I could never find that sweet spot of how do I navigate these two worlds? And with therapy, I've been able to really develop that over time and also understand that I am how I am partly because of my nature, but also because of my nurture, right? It's a mix of both those things. Yeah. And, and going back to the awareness or the space between the thoughts, Reading and listening to Eckhart Tolle and Michael A. Singer really helped me understand that I am not my thoughts, but I am the awareness of my thoughts. That really changed the way that I live my life. Like I said, we have over 60,000 thoughts every single day, but they're just almost like cars going on the highway. But who I am, I'm the person who has actually can witness the thought. I don't have to react to it. I don't have to put more fire into it and add to it. And that I really got through self-inquiry, curiosity, and compassion. And I believe that all of those things I really developed because I've done therapy and I've had these safe spaces to explore these things. Yeah. Yeah. And not really a conversation that maybe you can kind of have and you know, you can have it with me anywhere you want, because I love talking about this stuff. But not a lot of people talk like that in kind of like, you know, a lunch environment or a co-worker environment. So just to be able to really talk about your past and your background and those contrasting um, sort of worlds that you were born into, because no child can really understand how they feel about these things. They're just experiencing them. They're just a sponge. And of course, the tendency is toward the negative, as you mentioned. So a lot of times I'll meet people who have had, you know, kind of a contrasting experience and they argue in their mind, but they land on that somehow they're wrong. Somehow they're doing it wrong. Instead of, as you now sounds to me um, have come to or work toward constantly is this idea of it's not wrong or right. It's just, it's this thought I'm having and my relationship to this thought is fine. Like I can, I can see this thought. I don't have to believe it. And I certainly don't have to kill myself to try to understand it in a way that uh, makes me feel like maybe I'm not right or wrong, you know? Um, I think that's the biggest thing in therapy is that we really realize there's a, there's a level of acceptance that I think is so powerful. Um, and I agree with you too, with your, uh, the authors you mentioned, both incredible, uh, people that continue speaking about that in a different sort of way that challenges just these preconceptions that we can kind of come up with in, as kids in our heads based on what's happened to us, where we end up thinking, somehow I'm flawed, I'm broken, mm -hmm. as a result of what the messages I'm getting. Like your idea that, you know, you wanted to talk, that you were expressive, that you felt like you were very sensitive, but to be raised by people who didn't nat naturally do that, you know, the end result could be that you could have felt like something was wrong with you. <laughs> You're in this mm -hmm. household, why do you want to talk all the time? Like, we don't do that. So. Do you think therapy also kind of helped you move out of any sort of blame, shame kind of uh, space? Yeah, absolutely. I have defaulted a lot to negativity and turning towards myself in the sense of judging myself, blaming myself, shaming myself. But with therapy, I've been able to really work through that. I'm not saying I'm fixed because I don't think that's ever really possible, but it's something I really need improvement towards. And having more compassion with myself, that's something that my first therapist really, really was able to hammer into me, self-compassion, which is really understanding that I am human, that I'm trying my best, that even if I don't feel good, 
it's not because I'm broken. It's not because I'm doing anything wrong. Nothing is wrong with me. But it's just challenges that I'm navigating through. Mm -hmm. So with therapy, I've been able to have more vocabulary, have more space, have more compassion, more love, more understanding. So it's just really been able to allow me to be a kinder version of myself mm. to myself. Yeah, kinder version of yourself to yourself. I might steal that. That's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I tell you I'm stealing it, it's not as much of a problem, right? Um, <laughs> I just think, you know, if we come full circle as we kind of end, if we talk about the angst and the, you know, overwhelm or the, the nervousness of starting therapy, and then you and I have kind of talked about in very brief uh, ways, your journey of therapy and how, what it's done for you. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of cool that therapy does all that. And it's encouraging to me to hear you speak like that because it makes me think the message is push through that fear, push through that uh, nervousness about it, the overwhelm, because there is only good things as far as, you know, in the, the journey of, of getting to know yourself, becoming more self-aware. Um, I'm not saying every therapy session is a ball of laughs. Sometimes they're not, and tissue is a real thing. But <laughs> this recognition of being more kind and compassionate towards yourself, the recognition of what you say to yourself and how you speak to yourself and how that then impacts your behavior. When you can get in there and really start to feel better about that relationship you have with yourself, you just said it, your, your behavior out changes too, right? So it just, it just, to me, it just really encourages people to kind of push through that reluctance. If they have the feeling that maybe a conversation would help them that that's probably really a true thing and they could benefit from that tremendously if they gave themselves the chance. Yeah, absolutely. And I totally understand how it can be overwhelming and it can be difficult to start. And not every therapist and client is going to be a perfect match. It almost is like dating. You kind of have to find just the right person for you. and. There's different modalities, different specialities, there's different, um, obviously, backgrounds. And it can take a little bit of trial and error to find the right therapist for you. But I think a message I want to tell people is to not give up because there's just so, so many benefits to therapy. And who doesn't want to feel better? Who doesn't want to become a better version of themselves, you know? And yeah. it's not going to always be easy. It's like going to the gym. You're not going to go in there and always have fun. No, it's going to be painful. There's going to be days that you don't want to go. You're going to be sweating, making ugly faces in the mirror. But you walk out of there and you're, you know, full of good, good feeling uh, emotions and you feel accomplished and you feel like a better version of yourself. So it's not a overnight fix for sure. It is a commitment, but I'm just such a believer in it because I've been doing it for so long and I've seen how much I've grown as a person. And as you said, how I treat myself, or in a version of what you said, how I treat myself now has changed. And from there, it changes how I treat others, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. just such a, it's such a giving. It's so giving. There's just so much to it. It, it provides so much for me and the people around me. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. I knew from the minute you sat down next to me, there was, there is an air of, um, I, I, I want to say spirituality to you, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's something that kind of reaches across and impacts me. Like you, you make me feel good. <laughs> I don't quite know how you're doing that, but that's pretty good stuff. Um, so we had lovely conversation there. We've had another lovely conversation, so I hope to have many more with you. But if if you want to share anything else about uh, therapy or yourself or anything before we end, I want to give you that opportunity. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Bonnie. I am so glad we did this. It's been such a wonderful conversation. I am just so inspired by you and you sharing your story and allowing people to 
debunk the myths of therapy and hopefully this and many of your podcasts will help people uh, get the benefits of therapy. But for me, I am a very open person, open spirit. Uh, yes, I'm very spiritual, but if people are interested about me, they can follow me on Instagram, yurichisu.com. Oh, sorry, yurichisu and a website that's soon launching, yurichisu.com. Fantastic. And I would encourage people to do it because there's something really special about you, Yuri. So I am so blessed and so happy that you did this with me. Thank you again. And uh, who knows, might have you on again. I would love that. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye.